So I'm going to return to spectral methods, and I want to talk a little bit more broadly about uh, what we can be doing with basis expansions, and I want to talk a little bit about what are called Chebyshev polynomials and the Chebyshev transform, because it's directly related to Fourier transforms and one of the only other methods that you can get n log n speed with in terms of solving PDEs or doing transformations in general. So first of all, let's talk more broadly about exploiting transforms. So transforms are almost uh, the basis of most of applied math techniques is how do I move into a coordinate system through a transformation to solve a problem a little bit easier. And we've been using these ideas throughout uh, our applied math, physics, engineering history. And so I want to give you some examples for this. So you may have a problem with very specific geometry or structure in which there's a transform that is actually allow, it's really tailor-made for that application. So for instance, we can think about things like the Bessel function, which is great for radial 2D problems. In fact, that is in some sense the perfect basis set to be using for things like vibrating drum heads, circular vibrating drum heads. Uh, Legendre polynomials, this is for 3D Laplace type equations. You have the Hermit Gauss polynomials, which come in, which are the basis expansions for Schrodinger equation, so quantum mechanics, with harmonic potential. Spherical harmonics for radial 3D problems. So for instance, if you're doing forecasting on the globe, these are great basis set to be using because they're actually structured for exactly the problem you're looking at. And Chebyshev polynomials for bounded 1D domains, for instance. The only problem with any of these, and by the way, we've used these throughout the 19th and 20th centuries for solving a lot of difficult problems, but as we've gotten more and more into computing and we can walk away from these, but what we've found is what we really care about is computational speed. Now, all of these can still be very useful because they're very, uh, uh, they're kind of the right transformation, the right coordinate systems to be using often for these kind of problems but often they are order n squared to get in and out of the transform domain. Okay, so for very large scale problems, order n squared can be very expensive compared to order n log n, for instance. Um, and so you ask the questions, which one of these transforms have n log n speed? I've already shown you that the Fourier transform in some sense is unique in this aspect in that having that speed because of the kernel of the transform having particular property, it allowed it to get n log n, but there's one other transform that is n log n, and that is the Chebyshev. And the reason you can get it to be n log n is because there is a transform of the Chebyshev to a cosine transformation, right, the discrete cosine transformation. So it's like a transform of a transform. So we're going to use the Chebyshev polynomials, but then we're going to express it in terms of the cosine basis through another transformation. So it's like a double transform, but then it allows you to use these Chebyshev polynomials, which allow you a much more flexible representation of boundary conditions. And you can do this all at n log n. So it's an important class of spectral representations for spectral theory and directly related to the cosine transform or the F4A transform. So if you haven't heard of Chebyshev polynomials, here is the solution to a sturm liouville problem, and T of n are the Chebyshev polynomials, and the Chebyshev polynomials satisfy this uh, eigenvalue problem on a domain negative one to one. And we know quite a bit about this because, in fact, it is a sturm liouville problem. Problem. So sturm liouville problems, which means they're self-adjoint or Hermitian, uh, actually have so many advantageous properties. The eigenvalues are real. The eigenfunctions are real. The eigenfunctions are orthogonal. They can form a complete basis, uh, which means you can expand anything. You're guaranteed that this expansion will, in fact, converge to the actual solution. So you get all the properties that you would get from a Fourier expansion, but now using this set of functions, which allow you a broader representation of boundary conditions. Remember, the biggest problem with the Fourier transform is that it can either only represent periodic boundary conditions, pinned boundary conditions, or no flux. So that's not a lot of 
capability of handling boundary conditions, right? So here, the idea is the Chebyshev allows you to broaden the class of boundary conditions you can handle because the Fourier transform is very restrictive in what it can actually do in practice. So it broadens us out, and let me just show you how we define these polynomials. They're given by here. Notice it's Tn of x, really, but I now replace x by cosine theta, and the way we define this T of n cosine theta is cosine n theta. So if you define this and you go through the ends and bring it back to what x is, here are the polynomials, t0, t1, t2, t3, t4, and so forth that you can define. Here's how they're defined. But notice there's the cosine of n theta. And cosine n theta is the basis function used in the discrete cosine transform. So right away you can see the connection, x is equal to cosine theta, as being the connection between the Chebyshev coordinate system and, uh, and the Fourier discrete cosine transform. And we know we can do the discrete cosine transform in n log n time, and this is how we're going to connect the two together, is through this, this, this relationship right here. So here is what these Chebyshev polynomials look like. T0 right, is actually uh, right here. It's a constant. T1 is this line right here. T2 is this parabola. T3 is this cubic, T4, and so forth. So they're all these polynomials. And so this is the representation. And what you're doing here is basically saying, I'm going to represent my solution as a sum of these polynomials constructed in a way that I have a complete basis. These are orthogonal and so forth. So you get all the nice properties of sturm louisville and a representation guaranteed to converge to any function that lives in this domain, negative 1 to 1. OK. And now, because as a connection to the cosine transform, I can get this, I can make this transformation in n log n time. OK, so here's the change of variables we're going after. If we say f of x and x is equal to cosine theta, right, then we're, this is going to be the transformation we have. So theta being on the domain 0 to 2 pi means x goes from negative 1 to 1. OK, that's, that's the connection we want is x goes negative 1 to 1, cosine goes from 0 to pi. And so we can say, I take my function f of x, but now it's a function of cosine theta. And if I take the derivative now of this dgd theta, I can use my chain rule to get out this right here. And just really quickly, no, no, no flux boundary conditions hold in this Fourier transform domain, but it allows us a, but I have to go back to the original domain uh, for, for what the boundary conditions actually are what they are in the original domain themselves, in the x domain. OK, so here are some of the expansions that we're going to be working with then, if we think about this uh, Chebyshev expansion. It's just like a Fourier expansion. f of x is equal to some coefficients times the basis functions, which are these polynomials, uh, uh, which are the Chebyshev polynomials, right? Uh, so instead of sines or cosines, or e to the i kx uh, here, you have the the polynomials that we've defined. We have orthogonality properties. This is how we compute the coefficient of each. So I have to compute this inner product right here in order for me to project my data into this Chebyshev domain. And by the way, I can do this in n log n time, right, by using the cosine transform. Here's some really useful properties. There's some really nice things that happen here. We have a bounded function. We have relationship among uh, the lower polynomials to the higher polynomials. This is very much like what happened with Fourier transform. So uh, the Fourier transform, the lower frequencies squared become the higher frequencies, for instance. Uh, we also have boundary conditions for these. We have this derivative relationship. Just like when we took the Fourier transform of, if we want to compute the derivatives with a Fourier transform, all we have to do is Fourier transform multiply k. This is what this results in here. It's not as compact and clean as the Fourier transform. In fact, almost nothing is, but this is still the representation we need because we're going to go solve partial differential equations and differential equations with this. And so we have to have this idea of a derivative relationship and how it works out. You also have some nice symmetry properties about odd and even. And so this is very much like sines and cosines. The sines are odd, the cosines are even, and so forth. Okay, So just another expansion 
but we have this pathway between our original representation, x of m, to discretization now to the cosine transform. So this is the transformation we want. We want to say we're working in this domain, negative 1 to 1, but if I move over to the cosine representation, this is discretization, and then here's where we see the first consequence of making this transformation. The first consequence of making this transformation from my original x coordinate into the theta coordinate, right, or the cosine frame, is that now my discretization points in theta are now in theta, and so they're unequally spaced, in fact, in x. So if I go back to the x domain, I want to discretize in the cosine domain because this is where I want to do my cosine transform. But what it means is for the x of m, I get a clustering of points at the edges of my domain. Okay. By the way, this actually has some big advantage for us for representing solutions that I'm going to show you. But for right now, that also makes us have to start thinking about I'm no longer on a domain where when I've discretized everything we've done up to this point, the domain has had, the discretization has equal spacing between all points, and now for the first time we see that, okay, my domain is discretized with a finer discretization at the edges than in the middle, okay? So there's an advantage in the sense, too, that if you have a lot of boundary effects or things that are happening at the boundary, you automatically have more grid points there. But if there's a lot of things happening that are interesting in the middle, you have to really resolve this, which means you might be overpaying uh, for, for the boundary itself. Okay? But overpaying, if, you're, if you are solving this n, y, n time, you're usually pretty happy about that because that's a very fast solve. Okay. So let's talk about solving differential equations. So really what we're looking at is an operator acting on a function. And our operator is going to be a derivative operator, for instance. First derivative, second derivative. In finite differences, remember, one of our main objectives is to understand how do we construct derivative operators. And those derivative operators were just matrices. And so we had to figure out how to organize our data, and then we hit it with a matrix to get a derivative. And so here, we got to start thinking about this in terms of the Chebyshev. So L, again, is going to be a matrix operation on the function f, which is going to lead us now to the derivative representation. So the b of n's now, we have to update those. When I did this expansion of the function, let's say they were the a of n's, but now under differentiation, what's the new function I get? I have to compute these b of n's. And so here's the derivative relationship. How do I compute those b of n's? Well, here it is. So if I take L being a, for a one derivative, f prime, then I, I, what I can do is I can compute what the b of n is in terms of the a's that I originally had before. Okay, So there's a nice derivative relationship that's there. So if I have the original expansion of the function, the derivative term is I can just compute it through here, through this, well, this known formula. Okay, So that sets us up for being able to use the Chebyshev transform for solving PDEs because now we know how to take a derivative and we know how to do a representation. We understand that we have to now move to a uneven grid point spacing that we have through the cosine transformation. But now we're going to exploit that cosine transformation to be able to get in and out of that dom uh, of the Chebyshev domain in n log n time. So that's what we want to think about here. So Chebyshev is one of the really important transformations because with Fourier, along with Fourier, there's the two transformations that you can actually produce results in in n log n time. And what Chebyshev does is offers a broader set of boundary conditions for you to still use an n log n scheme. So that's why it's such an important method computationally.